What's up guys and girls? In today's video we are going to go over how to program your first game in Python. So in this video we'll be programming in Python 3 and then using Sublime Text 3 as our editor. And by the end of this video you'll have a game that looks like this. It's a very basic game where you're controlling the red block and you're trying to dodge these blue blocks that are falling. And as the score increases, the speed of the blocks increases as well. So as you can see now, it's getting a little faster, getting a little harder. Um, and if I do ever collide with a blue block, it says game over down here and your score. So this is what you'll have completed by the end of this video. And you should have some programming knowledge to do this video. All the knowledge you need for this is in the first five Python tutorials I've posted on my YouTube channel. So if you check the description for those videos and watch through them all, you'll be like more than prepared for this video. And also if you haven't set up your development environment with Sublime Text and Python 3, I'll also have a link in the description to set up everything so you're ready to get going in this video. All right, in this video, we're gonna be using the Pygame library of Python. So if you don't have this already installed, open up a command prompt if you're on Windows or a terminal if you're on Mac and type in the command pip install pygame and that should install it uh, properly. If uh, the, the command pip isn't recognized, you probably didn't install Python properly. So I recommend just rewatching my setup video, uninstalling whatever you have and uh, reinstalling. And potentially if you're on Mac, you might have to, instead of typing pip install pygame, you'll have to type pip3 install pygame. So if the first command doesn't work for you, try typing pip3 install pygame. Okay, once you have pygame installed, open up a new Python file. I just called mine game.py. And we'll go through the basic setup of the pygame. Like whenever you do a pygame project, the basic setup of that. So the first line we always need to write is import pygame. And we should run that and make sure it doesn't give us an error. If it did give you an error right there with that import, make sure you installed Pygame properly. So maybe run through those pip commands again and make sure that they actually said Pygame was installed. And if you're on Mac, remember, you might have to do pip3 instead of just pip install Pygame. Okay, so we have Pygame. Then the first line we need to always do is initialize Pygame. So we do pygame.init. And when I, when I forget how to do this, I usually just look it up online. So if you look up like, build a, like building a Pygame, in Python, this, these like the basic commands you'll start your file out with will be provided by someone else on the internet. So pygame.init, run that, still nothing is happening. So we wanna actually create a screen in Pygame. So to do a screen, we can do screen equals pygame.display.setMode and then we pass in a tuple of width and height. So the width would be like something like 800 and the height we'll say is something like 600 and this is in pixels. So if I run that, you should see a screen pop up and then quickly close and don't worry about it quickly closing. We'll fix that in uh, a few minutes. So we have a screen of width 800 and height 600 pixels. One thing I recommend you do is instead of directly passing in these numbers here, Let's uh, initialize two variables that hold those values. So we're gonna initialize a width variable, which is equal to 800, and a height variable, which is equal to 600. And the reason we're doing this is because we'll wanna probably use our width and height when we're building this game. So if we set variables to equal the width and height, uh, then we can easily access those things throughout our game. And also if we wanted to say one day, change our width to like a thousand pixels. If we have a variable, it makes everything else easier because we don't have to switch every one of these values in our code. We just have to switch it right here. So let's say, we, okay, we'll go back to 800 with the width and let's say we wanted the height 600. So we'll just pass in height right here. So now if I run that, run, you still, the same screen pops up and then just closes because we haven't handled the close condition yet. Okay, so the next thing we'll wanna do is develop our game loop. So basically what is gonna happen with Pygame is we're gonna have a loop that's just running while our game's not over. So we'll have like while not game over. And then we'll have, Pygame is an event-based programming 
uh, library. So we'll have a for loop inside of this while loop that will track all of our events. So it's going to look like something like this. And as I said, I'm, I'm, whenever I'm making this from scratch, I'm usually looking up the just kind of the basics online and then just kind of importing them in. So don't worry about like having to memorize this. So we're going to do, we're going to say a variable called game over is initially equal to false. And then we're going to have a loop that says while not game over. So that's going to keep running until we hit the game over condition. And what we want to do is have now a for loop, which is going to get the events in Pygame. So for event in pygame.event.get. And to start out, I'm just going to print event. So if I run this, if you see down here at the bottom of my screen, it's tracking everything I do on the screen. And this is super helpful for us because now we can, any action we do during our game, we track it with this events and we can use it to help us program specific things to happen based off of certain events. So this is super useful, these events. And notice there's like a bunch of different ones, mouse motion, mouse button up, mouse button down, key presses, key like down, key up. Um, let me think like you can do escape, all sorts of different things you can do with these events. And then I'll close out. And actually the closing out won't be handled right now properly. So I have to manually close it. Uh, shoot, <laughs> I'll fix that in one sec. So I'm just gonna cancel build up here. So if you, you can't exit out, just go up to tools, cancel build or do control plus break. Okay, so the first event we have to handle and this happens in I think every pie game you're gonna make is we have to do one event type that's called the kind of quit event. So if we do up top, we do, in this for loop we're gonna do if event dot type equals equals pie game dot quit. If that happens, then we want to do a system exit. So sys dot exit. And we'll actually have to import the system library and that comes pre-installed on every Python version. So now if I run this and I click this X right here, it lets me quit out properly. All right, so that's our basic screen. All right, so now that we have our screen, let's begin drawing shapes on our screen that will eventually move around and manipulate. So whenever I need to know how to do something, I either do a Google search or I look up on this official pygame.org slash docs. So this has all the different things you can do in Pygame. So I wanna right now, I wanna draw something. So I'm gonna click on the draw section of the docs. And I just wanna begin by just drawing a rectangle. That's the simplest shape. So we'll begin with just drawing a rectangle. So this gives us the command to draw a rectangle. So I can do pygame.draw.rect. Then I need to pass in something like this. So this is how a rectangle is defined. So let's do that real quick. So let's, we want to just draw a shape somewhere on our screen. So I'm going to just do, we want to do this outside of the event loop. We want to do it just at the same level as this for loop. So outside of that, but inside the while not game over, we want to do pygame.draw.rect. And then if I look at the documentation one more time, it takes in a surface. So the surface is going to be our screen in this case. The color, this is going to be an RGB color value, which RGB is just, there's three values that each, each have zero to 255 and they together make a color. So look into RGB colors if you haven't heard of them before. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You don't really need to know too much about it. And then the rectangle and a rectangle is defined by, I think, X location, Y location, width and height, and then width. So to figure out the rectangle real quick, I'll go to rect and yeah, left, top, width, height. That's gonna be how we draw a rectangle. So let's do this. So pygame.drawrect, surface is the screen. Next we need to do the color. So we'll just say we wanna draw a red square 
So to do red in Pi game, we do 255, 0, 0. That's an RGB for red, because red has 255, and the green and blue slots have zeros, which means no color, so it's just going to be red. Now we need to do our rectangle, and to define that, we did left position, top position, um, and then width and height. So we'll just do it somewhere in the middle of the screen. So I'm going to just say like 300, 400, or actually we'll do it the other way, 400, 300, and then width will be like 50, and height will be like 50. And then finally, the last part of the rectangle, drawing the rectangle was um, the width, and that's an optional parameter. If it says equal to zero, that means optional. So this is just the outline of our shape, and I'm just not gonna bother with it. So we'll just draw this. Okay, so right now, I'm drawing a rectangle, but we actually don't see it on the screen. And that's because in Pygame we need to do a command. We need to update our screen every iteration. So I can do something like pygame.display.update. And now we have that red square drawn in the center of our screen. And a couple things to note uh, for good practice is we should, instead of just defining these things inside of this, let's try to make this a little neater and kind of allow someone reading our code to understand more what we're doing. So for example, with this red, let's uh, delete this and go up to the top of our screen and just define it as a like constant variable. So red is equal to 255, zero, zero. And now when we're drawing the rectangle, we can pass in red as opposed to that like number that might not mean as much to people. Same thing for these 400 and 350s. Instead of defining them just as numbers inside of this draw function, let's give them variables that add meaning to what they are. So we'll say, we'll, we'll call a variable maybe player position. So this is, the red square is gonna be our player. And so we're gonna define a tuple that is the position of the player. So that's gonna be something like, we'll, we'll define it as a list that is 400 and 300. And we could even go a step farther and we call this player X, player Y, but we'll just do 400, 300. So when I was drawing this, I could do um, player position index of zero and player position. This is from the indexing video, the list video I have on Python one to get these two values. And then let's also define a player size. So player size is gonna be equal to 50, both width and height. We'll just make this a square for now. So this is gonna be player size and this next variable, or this next value is gonna be player size as well. And it still works, cool. So we just made it neater. So now I can read this code. We can read this code easier um, than when it was just a bunch of numbers floating all over the place. So what this is called in programming is we had initially a bunch of magic numbers floating around our screen. And basically they're called magic numbers because someone reading our code might not know, have any idea where they come from. But now that we define some of these variables, it's a lot easier to read our code and understand what's actually happening here. Okay, now let's get the movement happening. So when we press a key, we can move this block to the left and right. So to do this, we're gonna have to track the event that is mouse button down and mouse, or not mouse button down, but a uh, key press down and key press up. So we're gonna track a new event. So below the uh, quit event, we're gonna do another event. So this event's going to be if event.type equals equals. And once again, I'm finding this, this event type from the Pygame library. So if I go to events, they have all sorts of event types listed here. So we're gonna wanna do key down and key up. So if the event type equals equals pygame.key down, then we're gonna to wanna to make some movements. So 
Well, let, let's specify what a key it is. So we can do if event dot key equals equals pi game dot and all the keys are listed in this documentations too. Uh, let's see where the key is. Event dot key somewhere down here. Uh, maybe it's uh, actually up here. Event there should be key. Yeah, key. So all the keys are found here. So key tab, key clear, all of it is located here. So I'm going to, want to use the left and right arrows. So if I can find left and right in here, so we have key, left arrow and right arrow right here. So K underscore right and K underscore left. So if pi game event dot key equals pi game dot K left, then we want to move it left. So I'm just going to pass for now. We'll fill that in a sec. And then the other if is else if, event dot key equals equals pi game dot key right we want to do something else and <clears throat> and the reason I use an else if as opposed to else is because if we use else then it would track any other key to be the, the right movement. We want it to be specifically the right arrow. So let's fill in these function these uh these if statements. So if event dot key equals equals pi game dot k left, what do we want to happen? Well we're drawing this rectangle down here using the player position. So if we can tweak the player position in this if statement, that's gonna allow us to move. So take a second and try to do that on your own. And then unpause the video when you want to see how I will go ahead and do that. Okay, to do this, I'm going to begin by decoupling this list and doing x equals player position zero and y equals player position one. So this is just taking our position right here and just grabbing the x and y coordinate just so it's easier for us to read. So whenever we press the key down, it will grab the x and y coordinates. And then what we want to do is we want to, if the key left is pressed, we want to shift the x value. So I'm going to do x minus equals 5. And if we hit event.key right, I'm going to do x plus equals 5. So it's basically just changing whatever our x coordinate is in our position whenever we press these keys. And then finally, whatever happens after this, I'm going to just set the new position to equal the list of x comma y. So the new values of x and y, whatever happened to them in these if statements, we're just going to reset it down here. And one thing to note is I, I took out this y just because in case you want to make your player go up and down in the future, you'll be able to do that with this right here. So let's run this. Cool. It's kind of working. <laughs> if I keep pressing the value, I don't know if you can see the, the block extending. The, the problem is the block is moving, but it's just tracking the red with it. It's not moving probably how we want it to be moving. And so that the problem with that is it's always drawing the rectangle, but it's never resetting the screen. So when the rectangle has moved, it's not refilling the entire screen black. So one thing we can do to fix this is there's a function called screen.fill, and that takes in an RGB value. So just like we use the RGB value red, we can pass in the RGB value black. And if I run this now, Whoa, we got, our, we got our red block moving around and there's no annoying trace of where it's been. But we're moving really slowly. So let's uh, go ahead and make this, um, instead of maybe minus equals five and plus equals five, let's just uh, move it one whole block size. So player size and player size. And so finally we run this and now it's jumping around our screen nice and fast. So that looks really good. And just for good practice, let's take out this 000, delete that and pass it up here. So we're gonna do background color um, and we'll just pass that in here. So 
You can change this to whatever background color you want. We'll just stick with black for now. So screen fill, background color. And now it's easier to read that line as well. Cool, look at that. Okay, now let's go ahead and get blocks starting to drop from the sky. So we'll get blocks dropping from the sky. And actually, real quick, I think it would be helpful to initialize our position to a slightly different location. So let's do, how about, um, instead of this initial location of 400, 300, let's center it right in the, the, the middle. So we'll do width divided by two, which actually will still be 400, but it just, if we change this width now, it'll stay in the middle. And the 300, instead of that, we'll do, let's say height. And if we did the full height, it's gonna be off the screen. So the, in Pi game, the zero zero spot stops at the starts at the top left. So if I went all the way down the height, I'd be down here, and it's drawing it then below the screen. So what we'll do instead is we'll do like height minus uh, two times player size. Oh shoot! I think I used a capital when I wasn't supposed to. So two times player size. Now we run that. What happened? Player size is not defined. Oh. We'll have to do this right above this line. Save, run, cool. And now it's in the nice position at the bottom of the screen. So it's a little bit more friendly now to having blocks fall from the sky because it's not right there in the middle. Okay, let's begin with just one block falling from the sky. So we'll define an enemy, let's say. We'll, we'll call these blocks falling from the sky enemies. So we'll say enemy size, and to begin, we can just set this to 50. I'm gonna set this to the same size as the player is, but you can play around with this as you see fit. And we'll say enemy position equals, we want it to be at the top of the screen. So we'll say something like, I don't know, we'll do some random value here now for begin with 100. And then we want it to be around the top of the screen. So I'm gonna just say like 100, zero. And I'm gonna print this out right be before we print out the the um, the player. So screen. Let's let's uh, declare the enemy as blue. So blue in RGB is it's RGB. So zero zero. Red and green are zeros, and then the blue value is the 255 in this case. And we run that. Oh shoot, I didn't actually <laughs> finish this line. So screen, blue now. And then we wanna do enemy position. So it's the same exact line, except now we're switching in enemy position as opposed to player position. So enemy position one. So this is the X and Y of enemy. And then we'll make it a square. So we'll do enemy size, enemy size. So the width and the height is the same for the enemy. Run that. And now we have this enemy at the top of the screen and it's set to 100 right now. So we should probably set it to a different value. So ideally what we wanna do is set it to a random value. So maybe take a second right now and see if you can figure out how to set this initial enemy position to a random value on the screen. And unpause the video when you're ready for me to show you how to do that. Okay, to do a random value on the screen, we need to use this random library that I've mentioned in the first video I did in the tutorial series on Python, and that was in the, the math and variables video. And there's actually this library called random. So we can use random to do the following and do enemy position equals random dot random int. So we'll get just an integer between zero and our width. So that will put us right in the middle of the screen as we want, just some random spot at the top of the screen uh, on the x-axis. So we do that. And as you can see, it's in the kind of right side the first time I run it. If I run it again, it will be in a different spot. So see it's now on the left. And there's actually a small error with this line as is. And that is that this could actually have a value of width. So if I instead made this width real quick, 
you can't actually see the block because width is right here at the very edge and then it draws it to the right. So what we actually need to do is do random int zero to width minus enemy size. Enemy size, save that. And now that will make sure it's in between uh, the width of our screen. Okay. Cool. Okay, now let's get the actual enemy to start following downwards. So to do that, we can do the following. So right now, this is the Y location of the enemy and it's never changing. So to get it to start following, we need to, on each iteration, have this value uh, change so that it actually goes down on the screen. So we can do that pretty simply. So we'll do something like, uh, let's see, if enemy, enemy position one is greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero and let enemy position one. So enemy position one, remember, is the Y position of the enemy is less than the height. Then we want to get it to fall downwards. So we can do enemy position one minus equals like 20, we'll say. And then else we'll do enemy position, we'll want to reset it. The else condition in this case means it's off the screen. So we'll want to set it to back to zero equals one. And one nice thing about using list is I can directly modify the enemy position in place. So I actually don't have to reset it like I did here. Um, like I could have just modified player position zero directly and not reset it like I did here. So like this is another way to do what we did up here uh, equals zero. Now let's see what happens. Okay, it's like freaking out. Why is it freaking out? And the reason it's freaking out is because as I mentioned before, the top of the screen is actually zero, zero right here. So when we decrease the height, we're actually going upwards. So what we actually have to do is add 20 to enemy position plus equals 20. See what happens now. Oh my gosh, it is flying. And one thing we can do to kind of tame how fast it's going is we can set a frames per second rate, a, a frame rate to our game. And to do that, we define a clock. So we'll define our clock outside the while loop. Clock equals pygame.time.clock. And let's just set our our speed of our game to go, let's say like 30 frames per second. I think that seems fair. So in the while loop now, we need to do clock.tick and we'll do pass in 30 for 30 seconds. And this should slow it down a bit. Yeah, so now it falls nice and smooth. It's actually still going pretty fast. I might slow it down a bit more. I'll make this like plus equals 10. Now let's see what happens. That's like a nice fall. And as you can see, right when it gets to the bottom, it goes back to the top and falls again. So now we have a falling block. A couple of changes we'll make to make this a little bit better is, first off, the block is falling from the same spot every time. So we should reset the, the X position of the enemy. So enemy position zero, which is the X position, we want to reset that to another random value. So we can do random.randint again, zero to width minus enemy size. So let's see what that looks like. Yay, it's going different spots every time. Left and right side, way right side. Cool. But we're still not going to have any collisions right now. Like right now it just runs right through it. So we need to do collision still. And also one thing I think is nice to do is instead of doing 10 here, this is a magic value. I don't really know what that 10 means, 
let's define a variable called speed up top. So we'll say speed equals 10. And now we can just do plus equals speed here. So now if we change that speed variable, so if I change the speed variable to like one, it's gonna move really slowly. <laughs> and if you lose in this game, I come on, you gotta, you gotta be better than that. But that's really slowly and we can change it to like 50 to make it move really fast. Ah, so as you can see, that's one way we can play around with like the level of our game. We'll, we'll reset it to 10. So we have a falling block now. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and detect collision. So first off, I'm just gonna write a comment right here that makes, that just lets us know that this is updating the position of enemy. Uh, but let's uh, detect collisions between the enemy position and the player position. So to do this, we're going to define a function and we're probably going to go by the end of this video, we're going to kind of move all of this stuff in here into their own function because it just makes the code neater. But we'll begin. The first function we'll write today is the function that detects collision. So we're going to do um, detect collision and that's going to take in the player position and the enemy position. And we'll just begin by doing like player X. So this is the player's X coordinate, just to make this neater, player X equals player position zero. And then player Y equals player position one. Then we can do the same thing with enemy. Enemy x position equals enemy position zero. And that's the index, the zeroth index. And enemy y equals the enemy position first index. So now we have their positions. And now we need to figure out if they overlap. To help us do this, I created a little visual so we could see what happens when overlaps occur. So here we have the player block down below. So, and we have the enemy block falling from above. So collisions could happen like this. They could happen like this. And if the player moved into the enemy, they could also happen like this. And then like this. Let's focus on what happens to the X coordinates of these blocks first, and then we'll focus on the Y coordinates. So if a collision happens, and also we know about the enemy and we know about the player, we know their top left position. So the player's top left position is piece of X, piece of Y, and the enemy's top left position is E sub X, E sub Y. So if a collision happened like this, we know that this E sub X, this left side of the enemy, has to be between piece of X and then if the player has size piece of X plus player size, or the, the size is player size, the coordinate over here would be piece of X plus player size. So one condition we can write down that we know will have to be included in our collision is if um, E sub X is greater than piece of X and E sub X is less than, uh, less than or equal to, I guess we could do greater than or equal to and less than or equal to, uh, greater than or equal to, and I guess this side would be strictly less than, E sub X is less than uh, P sub X. I mean, it won't really matter because this is just a pixel difference, but P sub X plus player size. So that's one condition we'll have to include. And then we can also think about the reverse of that. So the reverse of that would look like this, would be if instead of the player being the farthest to the left, we have the enemy actually to the, the farthest to the left. And if that was the case, then we can ignore this right side for now, but we know that piece of X now right here has to fall in between E sub X and then E sub X plus enemy size. So the other condition we can write here is 
Um, we also need, so this is an or condition. So or, and this is, we're just looking at the x coordinate right now. Or p sub x is greater than or equal to e sub x. So this is the reverse. And p sub x is less than uh, e sub x plus enemy enemy wow sorry size let's type that up in our sublime text window we said um, if e sub x so i'm going to just go back real quick and look at what it said e sub x is greater than or equal to p sub x oh my god p sub x is greater than or equal to p sub x and e sub x is less than p sub x plus player size. So this is the coordinates. Um, that's one condition and x can inter overlap and there be a collision. Or the other condition was p sub x, just the reverse, is greater than or equal to e sub x. And p sub x is less than e sub x plus enemy size. And I'll put this in parentheses just to be careful. And just so that this stuff evaluates in the, the proper way, I'm gonna surround this with parentheses. Don't know if it really matters, but it just, I guess, good to be safe in this in parentheses over here. So these are the two ways the X coordinate could overlap. So let's do the same thing for the Y coordinate. So I'm gonna erase the screen here. Give me one sec. Okay, let's just raise out the enemy again. So we, we've taken care of whether or not the X's overlap. Now we need to make sure that the Y's, we need to check to see if the Y's overlap. So I'm gonna hide this real quick. So if the Y's overlap, then we're gonna have something looking like this. So we have Let's say this is the overlap position. We have p sub x, p sub y, and e sub x, e sub y. And if the y's are to overlap, then we would have something that looks like this. So we need e sub y to be between p sub y and p sub y plus player size. So it's the same exact thing. So we either need that to happen or the reverse of that is if this enemy is the top block. We need P sub Y to be between E sub Y and E sub Y plus enemy size. So I don't know if you can see that. So, and if both of those conditions happen, so if the X condition happens and then either one of the Y conditions happens, then we know we both have a X intersect and a Y intersect. So we know that there's a collision. So to write the Y condition, we'll basically just mirror the x condition and that will we'll do if e sub y is greater than or equal to p sub y uh, and e sub y is less than p sub y plus player size um, and we'll have two parentheses here or this is just the mirror of the other one p sub y is greater than or equal to e sub y and p sub y is less than e sub y plus enemy size. So this is gonna be for the y condition. And if you know we either have an X, the first condition up here checks to see if there's an X overlap. And then once we check if there's an X overlap, if there's also a Y overlap with one of these corners, then we know there is gonna be a collision. So we want to return true here. And if it doesn't enter these, then outside here we want to return false. And if it does enter, once we return false, it exits out of the, the function and would never run this. So this only runs if you this doesn't pass or this line doesn't pass. Okay, let's check to see if that works. So to do this, we'll go back to our game loop. And basically, we'll just do if, so we've updated the enemy position at this point. So if detect collision 
of, let's see how we wrote the function, player position, enemy position. So if detect collision of player position, enemy position. So if that returns true, then the game should be over, right? Game over equals true. And we don't really need to worry about the else condition because the else condition would just allow the game to keep running. So let's see if that works. Okay, oh, I'll let this one pass. Okay, second one will it. Yay, it looked like it worked. And it might look better if we actually break out of the loop right here because um, if we break out of the loop, then we don't draw the rectangles one additional time. So I'm gonna just check this. It might not look any better, but I just wanna see what I think of this. Run. So now if we collide, I'll let the next block. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's more, there's less overlap in the collision. It kind of stops it right when uh, they touch. And so I guess it's kind of a personal preference there, what you think looks better. So if you, if you do want it to just break out immediately, use the break command. If not, just you can get rid of it. Doesn't really matter. Okay, now that we've done collisions, let's uh, go ahead and actually draw multiple enemies. So right now we only have a single enemy following. Let's uh, change our code up so that we can actually have many different enemies following. following. To do this, we're gonna do a couple things. So I guess we need a function that controls how many enemies should be on the screen at a certain time. So that will be one function. And then another function, we'll probably have to modify detect collision or do some sort of update positions function for all the enemies so that we can, you know, control each enemy updating instead of just doing this right here. So we'll do a drop, drop enemy function. We'll also do a update enemy position function, I think. And we'll see if we need to do anything more than that. So let's begin with the drop enemy function. So what we're gonna do is that instead of having just an enemy position here, I'm gonna define a enemy list as well. And that will equal be empty at first, or I guess we could keep our original enemy and I could just pass in enemy position to start. So it just has a single enemy in it right now. And so the function we're gonna call drop enemy or drop enemies, we'll look at this enemy list. And to begin, let's say we wanna keep adding enemies until we have 10 total in our list. So to do this, I'm gonna do, um, if length enemy list is less than 10, then we want to, I guess, generate a random enemy. So we'll do x position equals random dot rand int. So this is just random spot on the width of the screen, zero to width minus enemy size. And you've seen this before. And then y position will be zero. It'll be the top of the screen. You can make this a little indented if you want to, but we'll just start with the top of the screen. And then we'll have to append this new x, y coordinates to our, rain, or our enemy list. Enemy list dot append um, a list of x position, y position. So that will be our drop enemies function. And then we'll have to have, I guess, a draw enemies function and a update positions function. Uh, and we might, let's see. So we'll do a uh, draw enemies first, draw enemies. And this could be put right into the, the loop, but I'm gonna just bring it out because it's easier to read that way. So all we'll have to do for this is for enemy in enemy list, we'll just wanna copy whatever we were doing down here to draw the enemy. So just copy this line, I'm gonna take it out of here and paste it in here. And so this is no longer enemy position. This is now called enemy, or I guess I could change it to enemy position in enemy list. 
uh, draw the rectangle for that enemy. So now it iterates through multiple enemies. Cool. And what else do we have to change down here? Well, we'll actually have to call that draw enemies function of enemy list. And we'll also have to call that function we just wrote called drop enemies. And that takes in the enemy list as well. I think we could probably, we're gonna have to comment out this stuff here because this would no longer be relevant, but I think we can probably run this as is and see what happens. Oh my God. <laughs> well, you have a bunch of things at the top of the screen, so I guess that's uh, a good thing. So let's see what we can do to fix this. So first off, I guess this, we just commented out the update code. So that's a problem. That's why they weren't following, falling. So let's, let's write a function called, I guess, update enemy positions. So to find a function called def update enemy positions. And that will take in the enemy list. And let's see, do we need it to take in anything else? Uh, I don't think so. So takes in the enemy list. And what we'll want to do with that is that we'll basically just copy this code right here. So copy this code and paste it into this list. And now we need to uncomment it. So update enemy positions. Um, and now we're gonna also have to do if, uh, or do a for loop for enemy position and enemy list. And okay, so we have this. So that's gonna update each individual one. And instead of resetting this, we'll actually pop it off our list so that our drop enemies function can take care of it now. So this updates the position and we'll want to have a else statement, which basically says, so this is saying it's on the screen. The else condition would be, it has gotten off the screen. And if it gets off the screen, we'll just pop that specific enemy off the list. So one thing we can do to, to figure out what the index of it is in the enemy list is we can do, this is from the for and while loops tutorial I have. So enumerate enemy list, and then we can do enemy position and also get the index. So index and enemy position, and we wanna pop off this index. And then basically the drop enemies function will handle this again. So let's see, we have draw enemies, update enemy positions, drop enemies, and we'll probably have to change this detect collision or we'll make a new function called like uh, collision check or something like that. And that'll take in the enemy list. And this will return True, this will cause a game to end if any if this collision check ever returns true. So so for enemy position and enemy list. I'm doing a lot of functions right now, so hopefully this all is making sense. If you have any questions about a specific function I'm writing here, make sure to just leave a comment. I'll I'll help you guys out. So enemy position and enemy list, we can do the following, we just need to use our detect collision function here. So we can, I guess maybe we'll also pass in the current player position. So if detect collision is true here for the enemy position, player position, then we wanna return true. And then if we get through that for loop successfully with no returns of true, we want to return false. All right, we have a bunch of things. Now we just need to add them to our loop. So we have drop enemies, draw enemies, update enemy positions, collision check. So let's see, drop enemies, draw enemies. We need to do update 
enemy positions uh, that will take in the enemy list. And I guess we want to update the positions before we draw them probably. Ah, no, no, update. I just uh, co <laughs> copied blank space, so it didn't let me uh, just copy that line in. Enemy list. And then finally, we'll want to do collision, collision check on our enemy list using the player position. And do we update? Yeah, the, up the player position will be updating from this code up here. So we'll do if collision check game over equals true. And then we'll break. So this is exactly what we were doing up, up here. But now collision check uses detect collision inside of it, but it loops over the f entire list of enemies. So let's see what happens now. Whoa, we got an er enemy error. Collision check is not defined. I must have spelled it wrong up here. Collision check. Yeah, that looks right. How did I spell it down here? Collision. Oh, name enemy list is not defined. What the heck? Oh, enemy. Oh, I can't spell anymore. It's getting hard as we get to the end of this video. Come on. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yes, we got it. We got uh, it working pretty well. Oh my God, but they fall so fast at the start. So one thing you could do if you want it to stagger a little bit, because right now they're all falling at around the same time, is a little bit of a hack. And it looks like this. So right now in our drop enemies, right? We have if length enemy list is 10, we automatically add the new enemy. So that means we're adding them all at the same time. What we could do is, is add a little bit of a pseudo delay and how we would do this, maybe try to think of your own way to do this at first to just delay this function working, like appending. So like only certain times does it actually append. So like every like 10 times it appends one of these when it could be appending all of them at the same time. Um, so what I would do is I would do a, I'm just gonna write a variable called delay and that equals random dot rand random random dot random and what random dot random does if you don't know is it generates a random decimal or a random float value between zero and one and any of those values between zero and one are equally likely so this is a good way for us to get some sort of probable list like do something based on a probability so we can now add a line that says and delay is less than like, let's say 0 0.5. So only half the time does it actually append to this list. And that will allow us to like stagger the blocks a little bit. And we might have to tune this value. So if that is the case, then only append to the list. Let's see what happens now. Okay, it looks like it's uh, staggering a little bit more, but it's still, they're all falling pretty much at the same time. So we'll make this even smaller. We'll make it 0.1. And look at that. So now the blocks are falling at a much more staggered rate. All right, to end this video, let's add a, a score. Let's add, um, you know, increase in difficulty as we progress in score. Then also maybe like changing up the background color, or like changing the, the block sizes. So we'll, we'll do some additional features right now. So first off, let's do score. So to do score, what we need to see is that if I run the game, run game, run game. Oh, maybe the game's already running. Oops. So if I was to run this game, right, 
basically we want our score to increase as we successfully dodge each block. So what we really need to do is just append or add one to our score each time one of these blocks on the screen that you can see with my mouse falls all the way under the screen. And so this is going to be pretty straightforward. So outside of our loop at the top of our screen, we'll just define a score, right? And our score is going to start out at zero. So now we have a score at zero. And each time these blocks fall and get to the ground, we'll increase our score by one. So let's see, how do we do this? So it's going to happen in this update enemy position. So the first if statement here um, get, checks if the enemy's in the screen. This else would check to see if they fell off the screen. So here's where we want to increase our score. So we'll do score plus equals one here. And see what happens. Ah, local variable score reference before assignment. So basically what happened here is we actually need to up to pass in our score because it doesn't know where the score variable is in this function name because uh, I guess, yeah, hmm, let me make sure, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't recognize this score because we never passed it in. So if I do this, now, now we actually have to change up how we call our function. So we can do score plus equals one. Where is it? Where's our loop? Where's the uh, update enemy positions? I'll delete this real quick. So update enemy positions, and we want to pass in our score now too. See what happens now. Okay, so our score should be increasing. And to check that, how about we print out our score right below update enemy position. So print score. And we should be able to see this at the bottom of the screen over here when we run it again. So zero, 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 should be one now, should be one. Okay, it's not one. What did we do wrong? And what we did wrong here is that score is a integer and integers are a immutable type. So we can't just directly increase the score um, by doing plus equals one. We actually have to reset score to point to the new value. So what we can do is a pretty simple change and that will just be in the update enemy positions function, we'll return score when it finishes. And we'll just reset our score. So now we'll do score equals update enemy positions. So this will do the update and also just return a value. So this is totally fine for us to do. Okay. Oh, am I still printing score? I guess I'm not printing score anymore. So we'll print score again. So now the score should increase as the blocks fall off the screen. Come on. Yes, yes, five, six, seven. So it's down here in the side. Wow, I just dodged a bunch when I was like trying to show you that the numbers are right over here. Okay. So that's the score and it looks pretty good. It's going up like we want it to. And so let's actually get that score to print to the screen. So to do this in Pygame, we can, at the top of our screen, we're gonna to need to define a font. So I'll just do this below the clock. It doesn't really matter where we do this. So I'm just gonna say my font equals, and I'm looking this, this is a command that I would look up online to remember. I forget this off the top of my head. We can do pygame.font.sysfont. And what I did in my example that I showed you guys at the start of this video is I used some font called monospace but there's a bunch of options. I think if you look at the Pygame website, you can find all the options. So monospace of 35 pixels. And then to actually print out the score, what I'll wanna do is, is down here in the game loop. So maybe after I update the score, I'll actually draw it and I can do that by doing text equals score plus so we can use plus when we're appending two strings together so i'm going to do score and then we'll do label equals my font dot render text and then we need to do the position so the position will just say 
uh, actually I don't remember exactly what this my font on render does but just follow me on how I do this so forget what exactly this one is here I think this might be the direction it's going so the one means horizontally I think if I change this to a zero it would be vertical text and then I want to use a color for it so the color will define will define uh, yellow so yellow is 255 255 zero and I'm actually going to copy this out and do what I did with yellow and blue, or in red and blue. And I'm going to do yellow up here. So yellow equals 235, 255, 0. And so we'll pass in yellow here. Then the last thing we need to do is actually attach our label to the screen. And to do that, we can do this function called screen.bullet label. And then we need to select a position. So the position I'm gonna select, this is just something I, I played around with before and it worked. So I'm gonna do width minus 200 and then height minus 40. So if we, you know, we know our font size is 35 that we chose. So height minus 40 gives us a little more space than uh, what our font size is. And this offsets it to the left a little bit. So let's see if that worked. Ah, must be string, not int. So the problem here is we're trying to add a number to the string. So what we actually have to do is we can typecast uh, values. So if I have a number that I want to make, not the number, but actually a string that represents the number, I can surround it with str of score. Look at that. Come on, increase. Yes, yes. I don't know if you saw that, but it was increasing over there on the right side. And that gives us a little bit of extra space so that if we get to like hundreds, the numbers in the hundreds, it still will work properly. But you can play around with that how you see fit. Cool, we have a score. All right, what else should we do? We want to do a level based on the score. So how about we define a function that's called like set level. So I'll do this up here. So to define set level. So that's going to need to take in the score. And basically, we'll change our speed variable. So we have this speed variable here based on the score. So maybe, so right now our speed is 10. Maybe we start out really easily. So uh, if our score is less than 20, maybe our speed is, you know, 3. So if score less than 20, speed equals three. Elif score less than 40, speed equals four. And we can keep doing this. Elif scores less than 60, um, speed equals five. Uh, and then L if score um, or we'll do else. So once you get over 60, we'll, we'll make it really hard. So speed equals 15. And so if we remember speed was being added here, so we'll probably have to, let's see what, if this works. I don't know, was it, I don't, I don't think it was updating at all. So speed was set to 10 here. These values here is not gonna reset the speed, it's just gonna call some variable, some new variable called speed inside of this function three. So what we'll actually have to do is pass in our speed variable. And then at the end of this function, we'll return the speed. So our set level function will happen down here, maybe before, right after we, update our score. So where do we update our score? So the score is updated here. So we can set the level right after that score and then speed. And we're gonna have to say speed equals set level score speed. So now it should go slow. Yay. We got it. We got it. 
Oh my god, this is going to take forever for me to actually see if it speeds up. Maybe I'll change these values around a bit. Yeah, I'll change these values a bit. <laughs> so you don't have to wait all day just to see me uh, play around with that level. Alright, speed, set level, score speed. So instead of the values I said initially, let's make this 5, let's make this 8, let's make this 12. Let's see if that worked. So it should now progressively get faster. So we got this. This is the first 10 blocks. And now after I pass the second 10 blocks, we should see a substantial increase in speed. So, oh, look at that. Yep, at 20, they started going faster. And we should get another increase at 40. Let's see if that happens. Yep, I definitely see an increase. And then our final increase will be at 60. And yeah, it's definitely moving faster. And in addition, in the set level function, you can really play around with this as you see fit. You could also maybe change the amount of, uh, you could make this like a variable, like enemy uh, number of enemies. And as the level increased, you could also make this value right here and drop enemies increase. So you could maybe have 50 blocks dropping at the same time. You could also make speed proportional to the score. So you could do something like, um, oh shoot, I'll just comment this out real quick. You could do something like speed equals score divided by five. So at the start of the game, it would be, I guess you'd have to do like, score divided by five plus like one or something just so it actually has some motion when the score is at zero um, but like this now if you got to 50 you'd be at speed 11 if you got to 100 you'd be at speed 100 divided by five which is 20 so 21 um, so this would be a proportional to the score this way and you, I guess you'd still have to return speed so that's just another thing you could do. You make this set level proportional to speed. Um, if we drew this, draw this out, and we like, I'll leave this as an exercise if you want to make more enemies drop, or if you can't figure out how to get more enemies to drop, uh, just leave me a comment and I'll tell you in the comments. But there's a, a bunch of different ways we can play around with this. So I'm going to just leave my function how I had it. So I'm going to comment this out. Uh, comment this out and just reset it to be this. Then the last thing I'll do in this video is we'll just play around with our background colors a little bit. So we got the game working. If we wanted to change the colors, like we can make our background color like, you know, some, sh you know, we could, uh, to do this, we could do, we could draw and use a website. So there's a bunch of like, RGB color site. I'm gonna just look that up. Online RGB color wheel. So I could take any value I wanted. So maybe I wanted a light blue background. So like something like this. So I know that it has 11 for R, 238 for green, and 207 for blue. And I'm on a site called Color Spire right now. So I'm gonna copy that. 11, 238, 11. 238 and then what was the last color? I forget, 207. So this will give us a nice light blue. So now if I run this, we have a different color game. And this makes the score a little bit hard to see, but you can see that the, the screen color did change. And you could do the same thing. You could play around with colors here. So if I wanted a, say I wanted like a tannish color for our player. I could go into like the oranges and you know, this is kind of a, a tannish color, 229, 202, 137. So I change this red, or I'll leave it as red just because I don't want to change the other name. So 229, 202, 137, 229. Oh my God, it's so hard to remember this number while talking, 202, 137, 202, and then 137, we run this. You know, now we have different colors. So play around and have fun with these colors. That's another feature you can change. All right, that's all we're gonna cover in this video. We went from having a blank screen to having a fully functional animated game, so that's pretty cool. 
If you enjoyed this video and learned something, it'd be huge if you would throw it a big thumbs up. And also it'd mean a lot to me if you subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers as fast as possible. Thank you guys for watching and peace out.